Okay, well, thanks everyone. Um, this is going to be a methods paper about how best to link individuals across historical census records. And so the specific question in the paper is whether it's possible to use pieces of extra information about an individual to break ties that occur regularly due to common names. So that's why the paper is entitled Finding John Smith. Is it possible for us to create accurate links for individuals who have common names like this, thereby increasing match rates and sample sizes? So we're going to propose a new linking algorithm that builds on our earlier work. This is joint work with my longtime collaborators, Ron, Catherine, and Santi, as well as Harriet, who is a grad student at Yale, and Myra, raise your hand, um, who is a grad student at Northwestern. So I don't need to tell everyone here in the room that the ability to follow individuals across historical data sets has broken open a wide set of important topics in economic history, including intergenerational mobility, immigrant assimilation, and the potentially persistent effects of childhood environment on later life outcomes. The challenge here has always been that unlike in modern administrative data sets, we don't have unique personal identifiers like social security numbers that would allow us to ensure that we're following the right person over time. So the first generation of linking algorithms instead used a very pared down set of individual attributes that we can be fairly certain are consistent over someone's life course. First name, last name, age or implied birth year, and place of birth, state or country. These algorithms, which we've contributed to, can match around a quarter of the male population. And the main reason for non-matches are common names like John Smith. More recently, there have been new linking approaches that use machine learning and are able to link close to half of the male population. These approaches take a much more kitchen sink attitude. They start with hand-linked training data that comes from family genealogy websites. So individuals who have put their family members onto online family trees, and now we have millions such records. That serves as training data. And then these approaches build statistical models to say, let's allow any of the possible attributes of a person to contribute to a successful match. The challenge here is that these approaches are not replicable. So if you use different training data, you would get a different set of matches potentially, and they're not customizable. So they're a black box. And if you don't want to include certain attributes in your linking procedure, you're not able to take out certain attributes and use others. So what we were striving to do was instead incorporate extra matching attributes to break ties in a procedural algorithm, uh, like the original abramitsky buston erickson algorithms that we will call here ABE. And what I'm going to show you today is that in doing so, we can achieve good performance, improving match rates relative to basic ABE, improving accuracy, and having no effect on population representativeness. Relative to machine learning algorithms, the benefit here is that our approach is fully replicable and is customizable. Um, so with code, you can rerun uh, the algorithm and take out attributes or include others uh, should you so choose. So what I'm going to do in the talk is give you the headlines on performance before I tell you how the algorithm actually works, because I don't want to get into the weeds and uh, be too boring um, before I show you the headlines. 
So if you're wondering, what does this actually do? Um, let's get there at around like minute 30. And instead I'll show you um, the performance first. And I'm gonna start with a simple cheat sheet of the acronyms that are going to come up. The procedural algorithms will be ABE basic and ABE EI, which stands for extra information. ABE basic, for those of you in the room who have used data on the census linking project website or have run the ABE code, you'll know matches on first and last name, age and place of birth. ABE extra information is going to add five additional matching attributes. And I will describe in detail why we have selected these five as we go. County of residence, mother's name, father's name, spouse's name, and middle initial. There are variants of all of these ABE algorithms. Um, so the most conservative approach is to require that an individual is unique within a five-year band around their age. So we would have Leah Bustan. There's no other Leah Bustans who are between 43 and 47. That would be the most conservative approach to ensure that we're not bringing into the data set false positives. There's also ABE standard, which takes an iterative approach and emphasizes or prioritizes an exact name match. And only if we don't find an exact name match goes on to a one or two year band. We're going to compare these to machine learning algorithms. Um, those are MLP and CTML. So MLP is the multi-generational longitudinal panel that's available on the IPAMS website and put together by the Minnesota Population Center people. And CTML is the census tree data that's now up online, censustree.org. Um, their machine learning links, which they call XG Boost. And we will also contrast at times, I know it's really low down, uh, to the full census tree, full CT, uh, which includes their machine learning links as well as the hand links into one large data set. So let me get to performance. <laughs> By adding pieces, the five uh, pieces of extra information that I mentioned, we can improve match rates in the ABE family. Basic ABE achieves match rates of 16 to 30%. And this range depends on which variant of the algorithm you use and also which census pair. As you get closer to the modern data, the match rates improve uh, due to transcription improvements. Instead, if we use these pieces of extra information, you can increase match rates by 10 percentage points and the range goes now from 25 to 37% of the male population. The improvements in match rates are especially true with the conservative variants of ABE that privilege reducing false positives and therefore had lower match rates. Relative to machine learning algorithms, the match rates are still lower by around five to 10 percentage points. And relative to the full CT, the full census tree, where you include the hand links, all the links that are made by family members, um, all of these algorithmic approaches achieve far lower match rates. In terms of accuracy, the way that we can measure the accuracy of a link, Randy? The, me the men. So for accuracy, we don't have ground truth links. We don't have anyone that we know for sure is the right person. So what's standard in this literature is to treat the family hand links as ground truth. So when we do that, we can look at what's called an agreement rate. And this depends on the fact that a link is made by someone out there in the genealogy world and by the relevant algorithm. So conditional on both the family and the algorithm making a match, we thought ABE basic did a really good job. We're like, wow, 90 to 97% agreement rate, that's good. But we now can improve agreement rates dramatically by using these pieces of extra information up to 99% agreement. 
And the improvements are especially found in ABE standard because in, with the iterative approach, there's the possibility of false positives. There could be a Leo Bustan who's 45 and one who's 46, um, and it would be hard to differentiate them, but because we privilege the exact age match, we allow in the first case. Um, and using these pieces of extra information to break ties improves accuracy dramatically for ABE standard. So let me visualize this for you. Um, and this is a graph that has a lot of moving parts. So don't worry, I'm gonna talk about each part. Um, I'm gonna start with the axes. The y-axis is our accuracy measure that I've just talked about. So conditional on both a family member making a match on the family tree and an ABE variant, what share of the time are those matches the same? The x-axis is similar to match rate. It scales with match rate, but it's not quite the same. So this is called a true positive rate, and this is terminology that comes from machine learning literature. So imagine that you did have ground truth. How many of those ground truth links were actually made by the algorithm? So the ground truth here, remember, are the family links. So the denominator is essentially different uh, in the x-axis than you would expect with the match rate, where the denominator would be the full universe of people in the census. And as a result, um, these levels do scale up. So remember that for ABE basic, the match rate's around 25%, but the true positive rate is more like 35%. Uh, so if a family member makes a match, that's probably an easier uh, data point to, to actually match. Probably the transcription is good, that sort of thing. But essentially, it scales with match rate. OK, so now let's look at all these dots. Each one of these dots reflects a different algorithm. To start with, um, the dots that I've circled in blue now are a set of ABE standard basic uh, matches. What you can see here is that the match rate is good relative to what I'm gonna talk about in a second, ABE conservative. So on the x-axis, these algorithms have shif shifted out. So we are able to capture more people, but that's at a cost of accuracy. So these dots are lower on the y-axis. In contrast, ABE basic improves on accuracy, but at the cost of a lower metric. So what, these are dots that you may have seen in our JEL paper in 2021. Um, and what we talked about in that paper was that there is a trade-off. That if you want to improve the accuracy of your links, you're, that's going to come at the cost of match rate. But if you want a lot of links, you can do that, but you're going to let in some false positives. That's really no longer true with ABE-EI. So what you see is all of the ABE-EI algorithms are shifted out into the right, both on on, along the x-axis and then up along the y-axis. So there's improvements both in match rate and in accuracy. You also see that there's a very mild trade-off between uh, the ABEEI algorithm variants that have higher match rates in terms of lower accuracy. There's a very mild negative relationship there. Um, so one way of saying this is that ABEI improves on ABE basic in almost all contexts. The two clusters apply to the bonds. Those are those are different variants and different uh, census years. So everything that is a um, triangle is um, cons is a nicest conservative, and everything that's a, a um, Square is a nicest standard. Uh, and so nicest, I haven't talked about, it's um, an approach to clean names so that um, spelling differences will be treated as the same name. Um, and then we also have some diamonds, which are exact standards. So those would be using the exact name, but following the standard variant. So there's basically four versions of every, um, of every, uh, ABE type, and then there's multiple census years. You also look at um, the selectiveness of the match of the observation in terms of like the covariant distribution and how far you are at another measure in the trade off? Absolutely. So let me get to that. Um, I planted Stefan in the audience. Okay. So 
Um, the next question would be on representativeness. And of course, we can only look at observable attributes, but you may worry if you're wildly off on the observables, what about the unobservables? So the next question is, does ABEEI have a, sac a cost or a sacrifice in terms of population representativeness? And what I'm going to show you on the next slide with a picture is that uh, adding the pieces of extra information lead to algorithms that are just as representative of the population as ABE basic. And that all of the ABE algorithms are more representative of the population than algorithms that are trained with handling data because the handling data is really wildly unrepresentative of the population. So using the handling data as a training data set to then uh, create a machine learning algorithm, the machine learning links are better on representativeness than the, the hand links, um, but they're not quite as good uh, as the procedural alg algorithm. Brian? So um, the first iteration of the NLP links would only go to the points. And I'm curious if there's anything to talk about uh, using uh, extra information from narrow spans as a final span. So, um, I'm going to show you at the end uh, some inference. So we have a, um, a father-son intergenerational uh, relationship that we've estimated. And in order for us to compare across the algorithms, we did um, adjacent census pairs for each because the MLP and CT algorithms are only available for adjacent pairs. And in doing this, we thought to ourselves, well, maybe it's better to use EI in adjacent pairs also, because you're more likely to have the same parents living at home with you in a 10-year span than in a 30-year span. And you're more likely to have a sa the same spouse in a 10-year span than a 30-year span. Um, so we've tested whether it makes a difference um, in inference to use a 30-year span versus chaining 10-year spans. And it really doesn't. Um, make much of a difference on inference, but we do recommend that people think about doing uh, chains when they're using extra information for that reason. Yeah, and there are six buckets in previous slides. Um, do you have a sense for what they look like by race or ethnicity or nationality? That's a great question. Um, we have not broken things down by subgroup yet, but we're working on a separate paper with Hannah Postel to do exactly that. So I don't know if no, people know Hannah, uh, but she worked on uh, an, an improvements uh, in the algorithm for Chinese Americans, um, especially because of um, name switching, where first names could become last names in the way that they were transcribed. And so she's very interested in how algorithms work across subgroups, and we're working on that now. But we haven't done that yet. OK, so let me show you what representativeness looks like. And Again, this is going to be a graph with a lot of information, but I will walk you through it. Um, so what we have here is a coefficient plot um, from regressions that take as uh, the universe all men in the 1930 census. Uh, and then the outcomes of these regressions are along the y-axis here, so they're the different rows. If you can't read it um, in the back, it's white, black, US born, married, literate, things like this. And then the right-hand side variable is an indicator for whether the man is in the matched data or not. So either they're in the matched data according to a particular algorithm, or they were in the 1930 census, but we can't match you. And then the question is, are men who are in the matched data systematically different? And the, uh, sorry, 21940. It's a 1930 baseline, 21940. So in the paper, we have um, all of these results for uh, 1900 to 10, 10 to 20, and so on. But right now, I'm just showing you 30 to 40. So the main takeaway, before we even dive into differences across algorithms, is that no algorithm is representative of the population. Um, maybe on urban, it looks like not too bad, you know, so there's a couple of variables that might be okay. But for the most part, you see that these coefficients suggesting difference between matched and unmatched individuals um, are on the order of 0.2 of a standard deviation. So there are substantial differences between matched and unmatched. But there's two takeaways from this. One is 
forget about doing any research projects that require linked data. Or another is, I'm going to do the research project, but which algorithm should I use? So which one is better than the others, or do we see some costs in making a particular choice? Paul? Absolutely. I mean, so group quarters would allow you to look at someone who, you know, might be living a more itinerant lifestyle. And you can see that um, matched men are far less likely than the population to live in group quarters. So absolutely, there's reasons to think that we're unlikely to match people who um, are hard for the census taker to find or who die between 30 and 40. Um, so you see age, for example, at the bottom, um, people who are in the match data are far younger than the full population because the older you get, uh, sadly, the less likely you are to be in the next census. Um, so now let's say you are going to do a research project and you're trying to decide between ABE variants. You're saying, should I use basic or should I use EI? The darkest, largest uh, markers here, the red and the green, are ABE, EI, extra information variants. And then the light red and green smaller versions uh, are basic. Equipped. And essentially what you see as you go down the rows is there's never a case where one is wildly different from the other. Um, so on white, the large red and green markers are a little bit closer to zero, suggesting that they're more representative. On US born, they're a little further away, suggesting they're a little less representative. As you go down the line, there's never an obvious case where one is dominating the other. They kind of switch back and forth between being more or less representative and never off uh, by more than 0.01 or 0.02 of a standard deviation. So we don't see a large cost in representativeness to choosing the extra information variants. Go ahead. So I think the concern isn't so much whether it's representative, it's whether it's unrepresentative in a way that's correlated with the common service. Because otherwise, you just wait these guys. You can just wait. Absolutely. So Absolutely. Is there any way you can sort of address that? That's a good question. I would love to hear good ideas about how to um, look at something that we think might scale with unobservables. Um, I haven't thought of something yet, but if people have ideas, we're very uh, interested to try. The final thing I want to, um, to mention here is take a look at the um, pink X's, which reflect the family links, the part of the census tree data set that is made up of hand links by family members. Those links are by far the least representative. So if you look at the likelihood of being white, far more likely, much less likely to be black, more likely to be US born, less likely to be urban, more likely to live on a farm, more likely to have children. All of the types of attributes that you would expect would be associated with using the family tree, being interested in family genealogy, having family members that, uh, that um, go far enough back in time and uh, can and continue on to today. So there is a real cost, we think, to adopting the hand links. There are benefits because the hand links allow you to follow women um, and combining the hand links with machine learning links also increase your match rate, but the hand links themselves uh, seem to be very unrepresentative. Uh, the machine learning outcomes that use the hand links as training data are much closer to zero than the links themselves. Um, but we do uh, caution that there is a trade-off with the hand links. Bill? Um, so if I understand the comparisons, it's, it's the set of links that are done with basic and the set of links that include, you know, it's the extra information, but they, they would overlap a lot. They do. If you did some analysis, people would be like extra um, observations that do that, the extra link observations. Are those additional observations as representative as the base or is it just a small, you know, if it were small, it could be wildly unrepresentative, but just a small share of the total sample. So it doesn't, so. 
Right. But um, yeah, that's a good idea. We can decompose into the links that get dropped out, uh, the links that get added, and the links that are shared. Um, so on, on inference, which has come up already um, and waiting, so at the end, I'll show you some standard intergenerational mobility regressions. Um, the rank rank elasticities um, are around 0.4 in unweighted regressions and around 0.37 in weighted regressions. So weighting does matter because um, men that make it into matched data sets are unrepresentative of the population in a way that appears um, to generate less mobility in, uh, in the regression outcomes. So if we don't, if we use the unweighted case, we have the higher elasticity suggesting, um, suggesting a less mobile population. Once we weight and we account for the observable differences with the population, we get the lower elasticity. But the range across algorithms is quite small. The range from highest to lowest in the unweighted regressions is 0.04, so around 10% of the coefficient estimate. And in the unweighted regressions, uh, 0.02, um, so around uh, 5 or 6% uh, of the um, average coefficient estimate. Um, so here we don't think that the choice of algorithm makes um, a, a very large difference. And in that case, you should think about um, the approach that is best for your specific research question. So for the rest of the talk, um, what I am going to do is um, talk a little bit more about how the algorithm actually works. Um, and I have a few more details on performance that I don't think we necessarily need to get into because we've done all of the headlines now. And then I'll end with uh, some suggestions for uh, research. So let me give you a refresher or an introduction to how ABE basic works. Uh, there are three steps. This is very small, but I'm going to read it out for you. Um, so the first step is you restrict the sample to records that are unique by first and last name, age, and place of birth in some data set A. So if you're starting in 1930, you're going to take the 1930 census and throw out any John Smith who is 20 years old and born in New York if there's another such John Smith who's 20 years old and born in New York, because there's no way for us to distinguish between those two. And then with your modified data set A that only contains unique individuals, you look for records in data set B that match on all of these attributes. If there is a unique match in data set B, then the pair of observations is considered a match. If there are multiple John Smiths who are now 30 years old, born in New York, that observation is discarded. So they could be unique in data set A, but not in data set B, and they would get dropped. And if there are no matches by exact year of birth, then you can search for matches one or two years older if you're using the standard algorithm. Paul? Initials? Yeah. I mean, if there are multiples of that person, then that person gets dropped. So if you have an initial for your first name, you're far more likely to get dropped either in the first step or in uh, the second step to be. Um, so none of the things that I'm showing you today uses Jar Winkler. So we're, uh, some of them use Nysis, some of them don't, um, but we also have a variant that uses Jar Winkler. Um, and we have a variant uh, that is using EM, um, but those are not part of the talk today. They take a very, very long time to run. Um, it could be a couple of months for one case. And so we're not including them today. Yeah. They'll be independent. Yeah, we do have um, a nickname uh, cleaning step. So I, I talked about cleaning names um, in the in the kind of red caveat. So we do have a nickname cleaning step so that Will and William would be treated similarly, for example. Um, and then you repeat steps one and two going in the other direction. So if you if data set B was 1940, you go back to 1930. And the linked sample will be the intersection of uh, 
the two sets of observations that link uniquely from A to B and from B to A. Okay, so that is ABE basic, and we're basically going to be layering on top of this uh, to make ABE EI. The first thing we need to do is select which additional variables we're planning on using. Ideally, we're using variables that are immutable, they don't change over your life, and always observable in the census. However, we have run out of such variables um, with ABE basic, um, and so we've selected some that are immutable but not always observable, like parents' names. When you are no longer living with your parent, then we can't see parent name, even though in theory this name should be the same over your life course. And we also uh, choose some variables that are always observed but are not immutable, like county of residence. We were very leery about this to begin with, uh, but we find, for example, in the 35 to 40 uh, question in the census about moving that around 90 to 93% of people are living in the same county five years later in that question. So we started to experiment with this and we, I will, as I will show you, county um, is a very useful matching variable. So what we're going to select here are, like I said, mother's and father's name, middle initial, county of residence and spouse's name. We do not select race, parental nativity and year of immigration. These attributes in theory could have been included and we exclude them because of their performance. So I will show you what the links look like if we include them and why we don't recommend using them. However, they are always something you could customize into the algorithm. So now the algorithm itself, once you've selected the variables that you want to use. Step one, you create candidate matches using each piece of extra information separately in rounds. So what I mean is you conduct non-cumulative rounds of ABE style matching using all of the baseline matching attributes that are part of basic ABE and then adding one piece of extra information at a time. You then save all of these matches. These matches may be different from each other or they may be overlapping and point to the same person. So each individual in dataset A could generate any number of potential matches between zero and five in dataset B. Step two, choose valid matches based on our uniqueness criterion. So let's think about a person in dataset A, call that person A1. We're requiring that they must be linked to only one unique individual in dataset B, B1. So let's say we had a father's name matching round, and that yielded a link between A1 and B1, but then we had a spouse's name matching round, and that yielded a different link. From A1 to a different person, B2, those, those matches would be dropped. And now you repeat these steps going in the other direction. So that's the algorithm. And let me give you an example of discarded matches, for example, because of this non-uniqueness. So, yeah. Yes, yes. Well, there could be um, a variable that does not vote. So you could um, look for a county match and you don't find one. And that's okay. fine. Okay. That's, then you keep them. You, then you keep them. Right. So think about parents' name and spouse's name. They usually don't coexist, right? Like if you're living with your parents, it's unlikely that you're also living with a spouse. It does happen. So we can't require that they are all um, that they all generate a match of some kind. Um, it's just if they generate a match, it has to be the same person. That's a very important clarification. Thank you. Okay, so imagine that you have um, A1 is Edward Hoffman in 1900, who's three years old and he was born in New York. And he's living with his mother, Wilhelmina, and his father, Charles. Now you run the algorithm and two of the variables vote. Mother's name uh, selects person B1, Edward Hoffman, who's now 13, um, and who's living with his mother, Wilhelmina. But father's name selects a different record, Edward Hoffman, who's 12, um, and who's living with his father, Charles. So we throw this person out. Similarly with Daniel Lair, um, who matches to two different people, B1 through the county match. So there's a Daniel Lair who's still living in Illinois, 1630, uh, and B2 through the father's name match, um, a, a Daniel Lair with a father named Henry. Paul. Oh. Well, 
no, we don't. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're very conservative in that way. I mean, I think that there's a, there, there's the possibility of tinkering um, and assessing the quality of each one of these matches. But for the moment, um, if the matches do not agree, we throw out the case. Um, okay, so why do we select these five attributes and not the others? Let me show you some accuracy measures. Um, so remember, accuracy is now agreement with family tree links. In a special case, which are cases in which only one variable votes. This is not typical. Usually more than one is voting. Um, but this will really uh, emphasize the point, and then I'll show you a more typical uh, case on the next slide. Now, this is an ABEI variant with nine possible pieces of extra information. The one we recommend only has five. But let's say we ran our algorithm and we included nativity, race, immigration year, and we also included ABE basic as its own round and allowed that to, to link on, a, to vote on its own. So the five attributes that we include, county, spouse, mother's name, and father's name, um, and middle initial, all have good accuracy, even when only one of these variables is voting and the other eight choose not to make a match. Um, usually around 90, 91%. Um, in the case of middle initial, 76%. The variables on the other side of the slide have low rates of accuracy. Um, Parental nativity, 58, race, 33, immigration year, 27, and ABE basic alone, 16%. So think about what it would mean for a match to be made by name, age, and birthplace, but for none of these other attributes to vote. Something like race is always observed. That means that race has to have not been willing to make a match. Um, so these, this individual that's selected on the basis of name, age, and birthplace probably has a different race. And that explains why the um, accuracy is so low for ABE basic alone. Go ahead. Don't you exclude those individuals who are trying to find their race or find their immigrant background? Yeah. I mean, everything about this approach is going to, to um, have challenges with, for example, Americanization of names uh, for uh, ra racial passing and, and so on. Um, this is true for every algorithmic approach. The only way you can get around that is to use family links because family members might know more. Um, I should say that um, on the project with Hannah, we are trying to use the family links to learn a little bit more about Americanization naming patterns more systematically um, and see if we can incorporate something like that. Naomi? So I'm wondering if the nativity one is... Um... Like German, Germans are recorded sometimes with some German, sometimes from the uh, principality uh, or part of Germany. And if you just did immigrant status. Oh, that is actually what this is. So it's not parent place of birth, it's oh. parent nativity. Just are they US born or foreign born? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So now let's go to a more typical case where lots of variables are voting. Um, and so I'm going to call the ones on the left-hand side good variables and the ones on the right-hand side bad variables. Uh, no judgment implied. And uh, let's see what happens when we include all nine um, and we break into two different options. One of the good variables voted and one of the good variables did not vote. And now let's see what happens if ABE basic alone votes, parental nativity votes, race votes, or Im immigrant year votes. If another good variable votes, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with adding these in. But if one of the good variables did not vote, um, we see that in the conservative case, we're down to around 70% accuracy. And in the standard case, we're down below 50% accuracy. Um, so we don't see that these bad variables are adding very much. We seem to achieve the accuracy without them. And if they're the only ones willing to make a match, that match is usually not good. Um, so we recommend not including those, uh, those four variables. Rick? We worked really hard on this. Maybe we'll be able to bring it back in. But the problem is that kids can change their order in the household. And so we're going from 
a variable to a variable. So race to ra race field to race field, parental name field to parental name field. But there is no kid field because there's kid one, kid two, kid three. So we just maybe have to get a little bit better at our programming to try to select like a set within a set of kid names. Is this kid name present? Uh, it's possible, but we haven't been able to solve that programming challenge yet, uh, given the way our algorithm works. Um, we should push on that. Randy. I'm really excited for what you're doing here. Now I'm wondering the other way, though, are we, do you, do you tell us what, what's happening with the consent of Kansas County when you go to the. Okay, I'm really glad you're asking this now because I planted you. Because the next thing I want to talk about, two slides, um, you know, the next two slides right here is can we capture movers? Um, because we're using county as a matching field. So is are we missing uh, people who, who change county? Um, so first of all, um, we argue that we are able to capture movers because men tend to move with either their parents or their spouse. Um, so we've broken down the sample into three age categories, young kids below the age of nine in the first census, teenagers, and everybody else. And then we break down each one of these age groups into uh, movers and stayers. And what we find is that county, of course, is voting quite a bit. Um, I should say, within the table, we're looking at the share of matches for which each one of these pieces of extra information votes on the match. So if you're a stayer, county votes a lot of the time, somewhere between 80 to 85%. If you're a mover, of, co of course, county never votes because county would um, not would not be the same for a mover. But we see that the young movers are picked up by mother's and father's name, and the older movers are picked up by spouse's name. All of the movers um, are we can also uh, add to the sample through middle initial. We will have some challenges with the teenagers, the folks who are. 15 in the base census and 25 in the next census, we see that mother's and father's name aren't voting very often, spouse's name is never voting. Um, and so that is a group that we do worry about. Um, and this is uh, precisely the reason why we think ABEEI is not going to be the solution for every research question. It's highly valuable and useful for most research questions, but not if you're thinking about children leaving their parental home. You can pick up some folks through middle initial there, but that's really um, all that you have. Um, but we also want to argue that the movers that we do catch are far more accurate uh, in ABEEI than in ABE basic. So now what I'm looking at in um, each one of the cells is our accuracy measure. And we see that for stairs, our accuracy is great. 97% already in basic, 98% uh, in EI. 98% in um, basic for older uh, stayers, 99% uh, in EI. But where we have accuracy challenges is precisely with movers. So in basic for our older movers, we're only at 78% accuracy, but when we add the pieces of extra information, we're up to 91%. Um, so I think some of the movers that we were finding in basic are not the right person. Um, and so while we do have some challenges, particularly with finding teenage movers with EI, we think that um, there are accuracy uh, improvements that make it worth the while. So I think that to answer that, if I can just quickly go back and this might help you, it's state of birth. Yeah, um, so we have. Are the extra batches that you're finding expected to the higher? Because before you would have thrown out 
people because they weren't sure what magic was. And I guess now that you like not throw out a mat so you can get a mat, as opposed to like before, there was no match that you could make because there was just no one with the exact same game and you know, game that it's in and it's somehow letting you like, match, match them. Okay. So I think if I'm understanding it correctly, it's it's all the former. So it's all people that we couldn't match before because they weren't unique on the basis of name alone, um, and then we can break the tie. Um, and it's not people who um, had different names that we're bringing back in because each one of our rounds in the extra information algorithm uses basic attributes and then adds on one additional. So they do have to be the same on name, age, and birthplace. Now that you have this extra information, if there's somebody who's using match on this extra information, you can start to relax the basic criteria, like the age could be like further away age, like three, four, three away. But if they match on like parent, spouse, you know, some of these things, you know, we might be willing to think that that person is the person. They're just, they're either, yeah, and then their name is the way for this, but like, the age might just be like a Great. Okay. Thank you. Brian? Sorry if I missed this, but if you have a person where, where all five of the characters are true, and you say this is a great match, do you then hold them out, or do you let some of the four characteristics potentially match the, to the person that you know has Are you iterating through this process the way that ADD just do by relaxing? Um, I think I understand what you're talking about, but let's talk about it afterwards um, because uh, I have two minutes and it's complicated to parse. Um, so I'm not going to go back into match rates and accuracy. I think we've already um, uh, covered uh, that ground well, um, but I will just quickly show you uh, inference. And um, here we have the regression um, where we have son's income rank in 1940 regressed on father's income rank in 1910 using occupation-based income. And we've done the chaining method that I talked about earlier, where we look at adjacent census pairs, um, 1910 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 40. Um, and we have basic in the top row and then all of the extra information algorithms, including ABE options or ML options um, uh, in the bottom row. Column five has the full census tree, so including the family links. And basically, I would say the bottom line story is these estimates look very, very similar. Um, MLP is a little higher than the others at 0.423, uh, but all of the others are hovering around 0.4. Um, and this is the unweighted case, the weighted case, um, all of the estimates uh, scale down, uh, suggesting more mobility. But again, the range is really tight. Um, once we wait, we eliminate the kind of outlier of MLP and the MLP looks very similar to the others once we've done that approach. Um, so bottom line is that when it comes to inference, uh, these algorithms perform quite similarly. Um, so if we're thinking about suggestions for uh, research use, if you think back to the scatter plot that I started with, it looks like ABE with extra information outperforms ABE basic on match rates and accuracy. So it's a win-win here. It's not a trade-off between the two. So for many research questions, ABE EI will be preferable uh, to ABE basic. And it's preferable to machine learning for researchers who want full replicability and who want to customize. With the same training data and running the same model, you're going to get the same results. Feed in different training data, you're going to get different results. So it's highly dependent on what training data is available. Right now, the training data, as we saw, is from family members who are more white, more US born, more likely to be on farms, et cetera. Um, if we end up uh, expanding out, um, which has happened uh, from first generation use of the family tree to today, um, then we would get different links.
Uh, so we think ABEEI is especially useful for questions that are focused on small specific subgroups where sample size really matters. Like if you're looking at small rural counties, if you want to break down a metro area by occupation and you get down to cell sizes that are small, that's where match rate really starts to bind. But we think that ABE basic might be preferable for questions focusing on geographic mobility, particularly for young people leaving home, or you can customize EI and just drop the county of residence field. We've tried doing that and the performance still looks quite good. Um, and we want to emphasize again that the hand links that are available on the census tree are very useful for matching women. None of the ABE variants match women unless we're talking about uh, never married women or always married women. And as always, we continue to encourage people to test robustness of their findings to the different linking algorithms. Right now, all of the ABE basic is up on the census linking project website. All of the census tree stuff is up um, on their website. MLP is up uh, at, M at the MPC. And we will be posting the ABE EI links up on CLP soon. We just wanted to make sure to get all of your comments and refinements before we did that.